In this episode, the ancient Jedi mind trick of cutting road noise by reverse engineering the wheels and tyres of your fine car. Or not. Hey. Fact me. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. My car has 21 inch rims and 45 profile tyres. Unless the road is super smooth, extremely unlikely wherever I drive, the noise coming from down there is fairly obtrusive. Straight away, you know this guy is a regular viewer, right? And I love regular viewers. It gives me a twinge down there. Back to you, John. If I desired a quieter ride, and I do not necessarily want that, but the front seat passenger occasionally makes cutting remarks, would I be better off asking my tyre guy for a quieter tyre, or should I look at downgrading to 20 inch or 19 inch rims? Having written all of that, I love the look of the big 21 inch rims. I get this a lot, you know, people who want to fix either the ride quality or what they call NVH in the automotive R&D caper, noise, vibration and harshness by reverse engineering the car's wheel and tyre package. John S, today's hero correspondent, he doesn't even have a particularly malignant case of this disease, at least it doesn't seem fully blown to me, not yet anyway. It's probably quite manageable with a few simple lifestyle tweaks. We'll get to that. This condition commonly affects males, okay? And it happens at the review stage of the car acquisition process. They enter an altered mental state where it actually seems like a good idea, a reasonable proposition to start modifying a car they do not yet own and have not yet driven to cure a problem they have not yet experienced and probably won't ever suffer if only they buy the right car at the outset. I guess that's the mission. At least John actually owns this car and the noise is a real phenomenon. So that kind of sets him apart. So let's drill down into the tower of noise and the attenuation thereof. It's very difficult to correlate, you know, proposed modifications and the effect this might have on NVH. This is one of the most complex areas of engineering R&D in new vehicles, particularly because you can measure frequency spectrums until your head separates from your neck, but Ultimately, you have to correlate those measurements to what some poor bastard out there in reality sitting in the cabin actually experiences. And this is the real challenge. In part, that's because we don't hear all noises equally. We're particularly sensitive to noises at three to four kilohertz. That's about the sound of a baby crying or the siren on an emergency services vehicle or a smoke alarm, stuff like that. These noises are selected for a reason, you know, one by evolution and the sirens and alarms by people who understand human hearing response. They're the sounds that are most likely to pull you out of a cognitive coma and get you up and responsive quickly. And the upshot of this is that a noise at three kilohertz is likely to be perceived as much more annoying inside the car than another noise at 100 hertz or 15 kilohertz, even though all three noises might actually be playing at identical sound pressure levels. So there's that. And there are also a great many variables when it comes to the generation of noise and vibration inside a car. Like, you can drive from a nice smooth piece of hot mix onto a section of coarse chip at freeway speeds and the subjective noise level, it kind of triples. It's a completely different set of NVH inputs that you might be trying to attenuate in R&D. Dirt roads are a huge challenge again, you know, smooth clay to rough gravel, they're all different. Wind noise is another bugbear and aerodynamic effects vary with something generally between the square and the cube of your speed. And this depends on the shape and other properties, things like flow separation and the positions of wake vortices, 
etc. This is proper propeller headed stuff, right? You need a full on laboratory and a university education in some applied science actually to grasp it in detail. So to me, proposing a bolt up fix with wheels and tires is overly simplistic. Take wind noise, or at least some of the noise that's being generated aerodynamically. It could be eight times louder on the freeway compared with around the city and in the suburbs. And then you've got the engine and the transmission, you know, it's all sucking and squeezing and banging and blowing and churning and burning and turning and squirting at all kinds of different frequencies. And I've watched a lot of movies on this issue. And I can tell you that there is a hell of a lot of research still to be done. As car makers make the bodies of all vehicles more rigid, they actually transmit more NVH into the cabin. So attenuation is an increasing challenge. These guys have targets to meet, they generally meet them, but everything is a compromise. Performance cars tend to be noisier than luxury cars for that reason. Direct injection is bloody noisy as well. I don't know if you've ever stuck your head in the engine bay of a car when it's revving with direct injection, but it's amazing that so little noise gets into the cabin. It may well be, you know, that moving down from 21s to 19s or 20s with inherently more sidewall height because you'd want to be maintaining the overall rolling diameter, it may be that this does actually result in a measurable attenuation of NVH, but it's just as likely that it won't. And in general, I can tell you that asymmetric tyres tend to be quieter than directional tyres, but beyond that, do you want quieter in the city or the wet? What surface are we talking about? This stuff all matters. It's also likely that you might not perceive much of a difference, even if you can measure it. The tread pattern of various tyres is certainly a salient factor, but at about a thousand bucks a corner, how many tyres are you prepared to cycle through before you derive the quietest one for the roads that you drive on? With wheels and tyres, it really depends upon the frequencies that are transmitted, the ones you perceive as a problem, and whether the sidewalls are in a position to attenuate those. And then there's this depressingly, counterintuitively kooky phenomenon that invariably occurs. If you are that propeller-headed NVH engineer and you successfully slash some wind noise, for example, the perception of road noise by the owner of that car ultimately is going to go through the roof simply because there is less wind noise now to cover it up. You get the same thing in EVs, right? There's no combustion noise, no direct injection, no exhaust, no valve train, no gearbox, no oil pump, no anything of that nature. Wind noise and road noise seem spectacularly loud in some EVs because there's just no mechanical cacophony to cover it up. The reality is that the noise level in an EV is absolutely lower. Wind and road noise might be the same, but one's perception simply shifts. And I remember the first time I drove an EV, it was several years ago, Mitsubishi iMeV. I drove it across the mighty coat hanger itself here in Schittsville. And subjectively, you could hear every defect in the bitumen and every breath of air past the wing mirrors. It seemed very loud to me in the way that the same platform with a conventional internal combustion powertrain would not, even though it was obviously measurably quieter. So let's say you're a breathtakingly successful reverse engineerer and you swap your 21s for 19s and choose the Goldilocks of silent tyres, thus slashing road noise. It's very likely that wind noise is going to seem much louder now. If you're ever lucky enough, it might actually be unlucky enough, come to think of it, to stand in an anechoic chamber, that's one that absorbs basically all sounds, like the ultimate recording booth, virtually silent, then you will be, after just a minute or so, absolutely shocked at how noisy your guts are, busily digesting the cow that you ate for lunch or something. The hot tip is... Your guts always sound like that, and thankfully out here in the real world, ambient noise covers it up. So in a sense, silence really can be deafening. In a nutshell, I'd suggest that reverse engineering NVH with wheels and tyres and hoping for a real meaningful improvement is a fool's errand. 
you will almost certainly degrade the handling performance of the vehicle and you might spend thousands and not get much of a subjective result at all, at least on the perceived NVH front. I guess this is a great advertisement for test driving the car that you think you want on the kinds of roads that you intend to drive on. SUVs are generally more tolerable on a noisy back road than a conventional car and vice versa in the city. It's important to choose the right tool for the job, right? Like everything else. You also need to acknowledge a fundamental truth. Clever NVH engineering is a bit like taking a painkiller. The actual problem is generally the shit caliber of the road surface underfoot and of course the speed with which you're traveling over it. All the propeller heads can do is take the edge off a little bit and here in Schittsville, given the spectacular condition of our regional roads in particular, that's kind of an uphill battle. Even the NVH brainiacs themselves are playing the game of compromise because tens of kilos of additional acoustic insulation, well that's going to hurt fuel efficiency and dynamic performance and it's going to reduce the vehicle's ultimate carrying capacity. So when I hear Mazda, for example, being criticised for being quite noisy, and this is a common accusation which is levelled against them by reviewers, this criticism often lacks balance in my view because some of it, at least, is a trade-off between mass and refinement, and the lower mass is going to save you money all day long by delivering better fuel economy and also better dynamic performance. When you think about that, you probably would not therefore want to drive the quietest car that could hypothetically be built, and your perception of the noise inside might not be that directly related to the actual in-cabin sound pressure level in any case. Cars today, you know, they're very quiet compared with cars of the 80s and the 90s, that's for sure. And as for this last point of John's question, this business of NVH being the front seat passenger's big bugbear, well, that's much, much easier to solve, Jono. There's an established engineering procedure for doing that, and the good news is you can do it yourself in your shed in just 60 minutes. You just gaffer tape her arms and legs together at the wrists and ankles respectively. You place her in the boot gently. Do not utter a word during this phase of the process. That's very important. There will, of course, be questions. It's quite important that you do not answer them. Just silently in the boot, close the lid. Then drive purposefully down the road for about an hour on the roughest, noisiest piece of dirt road you can find. Then you just stop, you help her out, remove the tape and gently place her in the front seat. Drive back. She'll be relieved and amazed at the experiential difference in NVH and therefore very grateful to you for showing her how much better it is in the passenger compartment. Really? Really? Are you sure? Well, that's quite inconvenient, you know, seeing as I've just laid it all out. Oh. Right, well, next episode, would you mind if we just did the research first and then we, you know, recorded the package? Because I, I think that's how they do it on television. I'm not sure, I just think... Yeah. Okay, well, I'll look forward to that. Okay, bye. I'm being told that this process actually only works with dogs. According to information just in, it's unlikely to be successful if attempted on a human woman. <laughs> if you've ever wondered what unconditional love really is, then this is the differential diagnosis. When subjected to this experiment, only one of the aforementioned fine creatures is likely to emerge from the trunk in a state of euphoria upon seeing you. At least that's what I've heard. I'm John Cadogan, part-time relationship counsellor. Thanks for watching. <laughs>